So um, I, I usually like to use this quote. This has nothing to do with reliability. The quote initially was about uh, business management. It's, it's by Peter Drucker. Um, but I think it applies perfectly to SRE and, and you know, the notion of that you first have to measure something and then you can improve it is something that, that applies to reliability. Um, and the reason we care about improving reliability is, is you know, because at the end of the day that's what our customers are experiencing and, and we're going to go a bit deeper into that on, on the why reliability matters so much about um, customer experience. Now, a bit of, a bit of history and, and how did we end up here? This is something we've, we've seen a lot in the DevOps context and how we had the wall between developers and operations. And this is how, how Google in 2003 created the first team called Production Engineering back then. Um, and the intention was to bring software engineers and make sure that, that the Google websites were running reliably uh, and they would improve reliability and all those kind of things. Now, as, as a few of you remember back then, there were these guys over there on the one side of the wall and they wanted to throw features over to the wall to those guys. And those guys cared about making the, the service more reliable and you know, things you understand when you, when you are actually responsible of a customer facing service. So what the guys over here decided to say, what the operators decided to say is, we have to define a few metrics which are going to allow you to throw things over the wall. So as long as our service is reliable, then you are able to throw whatever you want and we are, we are going to be responsible for running it at a specific, um, specific reliability level. So um, that's, how, that's how SLIs and SLOs uh, came about. And, and the idea was that in order for us to, to maintain our, our visitors, in order for us to, to have people coming again and again in our websites, um, we have to promise that we're going we're gonna to provide a specific, a specific uh, service level. And what we cared about back then, we, you know, we didn't have microservices, we didn't have complicated user journeys, it was pretty much simple. We want the, service to be, we want the website to be up and running. So essentially, that was our SLI. The SLI was uptime, service uptime. And then the SLO was defined and the SLO was a target. So what kind of uptime do we want to achieve? And you know, if we want to achieve 99.99%, a, a which means that 99.99% of the time the website is available, that's our SLO, that's the target. And then we can go back to the, to the customer and promise that we are going to uh, we're going to provide this, at least this level of service. And usually the SLOs are, are larger than the SLAs because we don't want to promise the customers what we promise internally. But, you know, and that's, that's with the history. How, how, di how does it work? How we define those? So we start by thinking what's important for the business. Back then it was just website availability, just service uptime, nothing more. Now it's other stuff. So we want to start and see what's, what's going to keep us alive, what's going to keep customers coming, what's going to keep customers engaged, and so on. And that's our SLI. Um, and then we want to think, usually uh, using historical metrics, using expertise, we want to start thinking what's, what's our target for that metric. So based on that SLI, what, what's our target? That's the SLO. And then based on that, we want to make a promise to our customers that we're gonna we're gonna be able to uh, to offer a service of that level, and and those can be either time based or event based. So we can say that the service will be available x amount of time, so 99.99 percent of the time, or 99.99 percent of someone tries to visit the website. And and it's important to set those, but, but you know, after we get those insights, after we measure and we, we see the SLIs, what, what do we do with this, inform, with this information? And the most important thing uh, of all this is, is the air budget. And we kind of focus more on the SLOs and the SLIs, but the air budget is where software development teams can actually make sense of it. And this is, this is where we start to understand that essentially SLOs are 
um, are a tool to help us to help us determine what engineering work to prioritize. It's we're going to use SLOs and we're going to use our budget to start understanding whether we have to prioritize reliability work or feature work, and this is going to help us prioritize our backlog. And 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 nowadays this also is automated into our product management process and so on. So the air budget allows for a specific amount of bad behavior in our application. So. Um, taking the SLO, the SLO, the target, we, we do one minus the SLO, so if we want 99.99%, 0.1% is our error budget, and then similarly with the SLI, we, we see our budget burn. Now what happened back then in the, in the Google SRE times is that if you reach a point where you burn your budget, then you can just not release anything to production. You only have to focus on, on doing work uh, on the reliability of the application. So, um, you know, how, how, how is this related to customer experience and, and how does this all come together? And, you know, we, we can kind of define reliability in a few different ways and we can use the, the technical terms that it's the probability of uh, failure-free operations and, you know, all those kind of things. But besides that, reliability is, is the perceived quality of the customer. Reliability is what the cloud customers understand as, as quality on our deliverables. And that's why this is really important. So, um, as a result, all of our reliability efforts should be customer-centric. And, and so should uh, reliability measures. So SLOs should focus on representing user impact and user experience. It's not about you know, just service uptime. And reliability engineering should really work closely with, with customer experience engineering, with customer success, um, and, and so on. And we've seen it that, especially in enterprise environments, reliability is what's going to drive cloud adoption. So, uh, you know, have, having that in mind and having how customer-centric reliability should be, defining SLOs is, no, is, is not just a discussion between the engineering teams and the architects. It's, it's, it's much more than just a technical uh, task. We should have in mind that customers are different in the way, uh, in, in the where, the when, the how they use our, our applications. Um, customers have different levels of importance of workloads on our applications. Um, customers, customers are different. Other customers are, are more important for us than others, whether we like it or not. And customers access our application from different geos, different devices, all those kind of things. So all those are things that we should have in mind when we are defining SLOs. We should also focus on meaningful availability measures. We should focus on what uh, on what our customers are experiencing, and and what what's the uptime of specific features, uh, specific functionalities instead of instead of uh, you know just service uptime. And again, that also should be customer specific. We should always have in mind um, the complexity of our application, the, the the inherent complexity of distributed systems, which is embedded in in modern architectures, and and of course we should. We should now integrate our systems. We, we, should, we should add more context to our data. Uh, and and you know, we, ha we have a lot of customer data, so we have to integrate um, service availability metrics with other customer data and combine those in order to, to achieve customer success. So you know, with, with that in mind, how does, the, how, how does the SLO implementation process change? So we have to start by defining critical user journeys. Um, and, and, and focus on business impact, prioritize those based on business impact. So we, we have to have in mind what our customers are using more, what our customers care more in our application. Um, these can be latency, load time, anything, anything like that. We, we have to determine metrics around those, uh, around those, the, those, those different journeys. And then finally, for all those metrics, we should define uh, we should define desired targets. And, and again, you know, using the context of the customer and how each customer is different and where they're actually seeing the application, 
those targets should be calculated if, if it's going to be you know, specific periods, if they're going to be time-based, event-based, uh, if we're going to do any geo-segmentation, those kind of things. And finally, we have to operationalize those metrics proper, properly. And that means put the, put the tools in place uh, that are going to help us utilize those metrics, those insights in our development life cycle. So, uh, you know, we should always have in mind that SLOs are tools that help us better understand what we need to prioritize. Um, and that's why we need to integrate everything. We need to integrate their budget um, and, and better understand where, where we should uh, freeze releases, where should we prioritize reliability, um, those kind of things. So, you know, this, this is kind of what SLOs are, how we implement them. Um, but what are kind of the common issues we, we see when we try to implement SLOs at scale? So one of the, one of the most uh, common issues is that you know, SLIs are usually discussed by engineers. And you know, I, I, an engineer myself, I've not always practiced empathy when, when I decide what to measure. And that's really important. We should always try to think. Um, from the side of the customer, Oft, more, more often than not, SLIs are not customer focused. Um, SLIs sh SLOs should have stakeholders. So if th something goes back, there should be someone in the SRE team or you know, someone in the engineering leadership team, someone who is responsible of mitigating this and making the decisions of how we're going to proceed if we burn th through our budget, for example. Air budgets are usually used uh, reactively, which means that we get an alert once we burn out all of our budget, which is, you know, it's, it's not something we should do uh, retrospectively. It's more something we should, we should use as we go and we should use it as we plan our work and we should use it in our everyday um, backlog prioritization. <coughs> Oftentimes, we set unrealistic SLOs target. Those can be either really high, really low. Um, you know, one of the things that has now stopped is back in the day, everyone wanted 100% availability. Now, I think we're at the point where we know 100% doesn't exist. So that's why we're talking only about nines. Um, and, and then a big one is that still the SLI, SLO evaluation process is, is, is really manual. We see people having Excel files or working through uh, through incidents and tickets and trying to calculate what the downtime was and all those kind of things and, and this, this also causes big problems. So specifically when we are trying to scale, some issues is that um, you know, when, when you have a really large en engineering organization, you usually uh, have different teams that implement observability metrics, all those kind of things really differently. Um, and that, that gives you a, a really different data set to work with. So it's hard to implement SLO standards when you don't have uh, you know, standards in the data types of monitoring. So um, you know, these different results in, in combination with manual reporting, all those kind of things, create what we call the watermelon problem. Everyone reports what they want to report using the data they want to use. So we end up having something really red, really bad, but outside it looks really green and nice. Another, another scaling issue is, is, you know, and I mentioned that before about, um, about how microservices, how distributed systems uh, have evolved over the years. Back in the day, we would, we would normally care about, you know, if, if this, if, if the front end is available, then okay, that's, that counts as uptime. But, you know, if, if you take a modern e-commerce setup, you wouldn't really care if the front end is up, if the checkout and the payment service and the you know and and the card service doesn't work. So so it's it's a big combination of things that that matters. Uh, and and again, we should focus on on availability on <coughs> on availability of features. And f and and some last scaling issues is you know when we have a lot of people, a lot of different applications, we we lack a common understanding of what service metrics is, what we're trying to achieve. And, and staying blameless, using it as, as feedback, as input, rather than using it to, to see you know, what we're doing wrong and blame one another. Um, uh, in order to scale SLIs and SLOs, we, we kind of have to automate the evaluation process. 
uh, the Excel process, then you know, going out of out of incident tickets, all those kind of things. Does you know, they simply can't work at scale. Um, and and also the you know, while we automate the SLOs, we also have to do that in a way that we respect the teams that are using different different observability tooling. So we kind of have to be uh, agnostic in that sense. So how does, how does observability come to play and how, how observability as code and SLOs as, as code can kind of help us scale this? Um, and we start with, with cloud native observability uh, and, and the needs for cloud native observability as growing. Um, since this is, this is what's going to provide us the, the good clean metrics to, to set the standards and to, uh, to automate the processes around this. Um, in order to do that, we need, we need good real-time insights. We need this to be self-service. We need this elasticity in our infrastructure in, in cloud-native environments. Uh, we need to have good, good alerting for different, different communication channels. The integration part is really important. We've been talking about contextual uh, observability uh, and, and contextual reliability metrics. Um, and finally, an, an SLO framework bringing everyone on the same page, that's, that's a really important aspect. And this is, this is powered by, by what we call the MEL stack, metrics, events, logs, and traces. And looking in these different, different data types um, from the angle of, of SLOs, you know, me metrics is what's going to fuel our SLIs. Metrics is what's, what's going to help us uh, measure against our targets, but it's also what's going to give us the historical data in order to define our targets. So it's going to help us also define their SLOs. Moving on, logs, if, if we are able to add logs, logs will help us add more context. So, um, you know, in, in our case, we've, we've combined uh, SLI data with logs and we are able to, to slice our data differently. We are able to have more contextual SLI so we can see SLIs for specific customer groups, uh, co impacted customers, those kind of things. And then finally, events and traces are what's going to give us the intelligent part of observability. That's, that's where we're going to understand where we are, we, why and where we have been burning through our um, air budgets. And in order to scale that, in order to scale our observability practices, uh, we are applying observability as code, so uh, this is gonna this is gonna help us promote better standards and, and you know best practices and standardize the data types uh, across across multiple teams. To do that, you know you can use a GitOps approach for onboarding new services, creating new metrics, and fuel that by zero trust in order to have a more uh, a more secure onboarding for 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 uh, new services. And observability as code focuses on metrics, logs, traces, dashboards as code, and, and finally alerting as code across different channels. So this is this is kind of how it looks like. So it starts by you know just you you just commit a configuration file. Um, a build is executed that builds a, a that uses a Terraform module, generates the variables files, and generates specific configuration. And then this is run across the, the production environment. Of course, it's tested first. And then the assets are published, and this is, this is, uh, this is run uh, across the production environments to create the new, uh, the new uh, metrics and all those kind of things. And this is kind of how, how it would look like. So, this is, this is a Terraform module. You have a dashboard over there, uh, a new relic dashboard, and here you have an alert condition, and this is an alert channel. So if, if you just go right now and try to write uh, a Terraform module in order to implement alert, um, mo a dashboard and alert as code, this is what it's going to look like. And the issue with scaling this is that you still want someone to understand what's written here. So. In order to operationalize this and scale this even more, what we, what, you know, what, what we try to do with observability as code is to create modules that use variables. And what's going to happen is a developer would only have to create this. So in order to create a new alert condition, what they write is, I want to create an alert condition. This is the NRQL. This could be PromQL or whatever else query. And then 
the, and then the pipeline would run out of, out of this, we would automatically generate this, which is the, the, the TFRs, and then those would be run together. So the only thing that, that the product, okay? So the only thing that the product engineer should know is this, and nothing, nothing more. So the, the only, they only have to think about what is, what is, you know, what, what is the NRQL or the PromQL query um, they're thinking about. So this is kind of how you can, you can make uh, observability as code even easier. And as, as you implement observability as code and as you, as you kind of standardize and you, and you scale these practices out, then you, you are going to start thinking about um, SLO as code. And, and in, in recent years, the SLO specification came up. Um, it's, it's an open specification to define SLOs uh, in a kind of vendor agnostic way. It uses YAML format, so it can be uh, kind of familiar to a lot of us. Um, and we're going to see how it looks in a bit. Another project I really like is Sloth. So essentially what Sloth does is, again, you write a, a configuration file, it runs, and then it creates the Prometheus rules in order for you to get alerted for, um, for, your, for your different uh, metrics that you're, uh, that you're measuring. So this is, this is uh, what OpenSLO looks like. Again, you define here that you're using Prometheus. This could be Datadog or anything else. You're using PromQL. This is the query you're going to be using. So this is the indicator. This is the SLI. And here you define the objectives. This is the SLO. And you know, it's, it's a pretty simple language, easy to understand for anyone. Now what Sloth does is it uses a similar file. And Sloth can work either with OpenSLO or not. So this is, this is a Sloth example with OpenSLO. And here we define what our objectives are, and here we we, we define what you know the, the, the query is to find the this, these are the bad requests, not the good ones, um, and the total request, what the target is, and then you're going to calculate that. And when sloth runs, and of course it's a much bigger file than this, what it creates is it creates uh, this Prometheus file with all the rules in order for you to get alerted, and it sets up Prometheus uh, that way. So how would that work? Imagine in an environment you have multiple Kubernetes clusters, you have Prometheus in order to monitor those clusters, and since you have all this distributed Prometheus setup, you use Thanos on top of that, and Grafana for dashboarding on top of Thanos. So you would use, uh, you, would, you would create the sloth file, you would commit that in the repository, and then, uh, and then the pipeline would take over, would create the, uh, would, would run with the sloth definition file, and would create the rules uh, that, that Prometheus would, uh, would monitor. And similarly, as we saw before with the, with, the new relic, um, with the new relic dashboard, you can have Gravana dashboards as code, and this is what, what it would look like for you to have uh, to have your SLO dashboard per service, when you can see uh, your budget, you can see your availability, and so on. Now, um, going into into a bit more specific stuff and bringing it all together and seeing what you know specifically we have been doing uh, for the past few months. This is kind of what what the architecture looks like and. So we have, we have a multitude of applications. So this can be AKS, EKS clusters. It can be uh, uh, AC2 instances, whatever that is. The ingestion layers, this, this is something which was optional. So uh, this can provide filtering, rate limiting. You know, for compliance reasons, you, must, you might need to add some masking on, on uh, the log data. Everything is triggered uh, by synthetic tests in order to implement outside in monitoring, uh, in order to add this orchestration layer on top of it. And finally, we end up to different backends. And, and that goes to what I said before. In order to scale this out, you have to respect the differences that different teams have. So you have to work with you know, Prometheus, Splunk, New Relic, Datadog, anything there is. And finally, this is, this is the custom part where essentially, uh, we run the OpenSLO files, those create the rules, and then this engine goes and queries, calculates whatever you have to calculate in order to define SLIs, 
and then we get the contextual data so we can create uh, you know, customer experience reports, we can see each customer, what they are experiencing per geo, if they were impacted in any incident, and all those end up in either reports or dashboards. Now, when, when we reach a point where an SLI uh, has, is, is pretty low and we have eaten through our, our budget, we have an integration with the release pipeline and that's where uh, the pipeline essentially has a step where it asks, you know, can I deploy or not? And if, you're, if you've gone through the air budget, then you have to go through an enhanced approval process in order to deploy. And, and you know, this part of visualizing is, looks kind of like this. And this is still a mock-up, it's not live in production yet. So you see, <coughs> you see the different SLOs, you see the incidents. But most importantly, you see specifically impacted customers. So that's where you can, actually, you can actually have these discussions with the customers and know exactly how they were impacted, what the customer experience looks like, um, and so on. Now, uh, throughout this process, uh, I, tried, I tried to think, we've, we've learned a lot. I tried to think of the three most important things. Um, one is that, you know, if, if you implement alerting for on-call and if you implement alerting or thresholds for reporting or if you implement alerting for SLOs, all those are totally different business cases and you have to treat them differently. So you cannot just create alerting for your reports and use those for, for on-call as well. That's not going to work. Um, SLIs, SLOs should be customer focused, and that's that's. I, I think I've said that more than anything else in this presentation. If you if you leave with one thing in mind today, that's that's probably the, the most important takeaway. We should always focus on on customer user journeys, on critical user journeys, and measure those instead of instead of measuring systemic stuff. Um, and you know, you should you should always treat this as a, as a, as an ongoing journey. SLOs are always going to keep on evolving. Um, start from something. You know, you should start from from a simple place, a simple application, and then you know, kind of grow that out. Um, so to kind of wrap up, the most important things we talked today is is how um, how observability has evolved, how reliability has evolved along that. Uh, with with the, with the evolution of our um, you know with the growth of distributed systems and distributed architectures, um, how observability is is you know is is not just about measuring stuff. It's it's really important to feeding in our reliability um, and uh, how reliability has adapted the technologies and and you know uh, how how these. Um, how these have, have adapted over time. Um, and finally, how, how observability and reliability come together and, and the role that those two play uh, in, in, in customer experience and in, in customer success. And the last bullet is a copy-paste, a mistake. So <laughs> if you see my previous presentations, you're going to let learn how KS Engineering can help you shift reliability left. Um, Thank you. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm trying to upload usually in my Twitter the the links for the slide. So if you want to stay there, I'm. I'm gonna add a slide about uh, a reading list and stuff. Feel free to connect on LinkedIn. And yeah, thank you for for joining me. And I think we have ten minutes for questions. Okay. George, you talked about um, using the SLO as a way to decide how you consume your activity budget. And you also talked about when designing an SLO, you link it to um, the business data, the business impact. Uh, how do you use that, particularly in a scalability uh, environment, to decide how big the activity budget for a particular customer should be? In other words, how do you price it properly? For a particular customer, how do you drive that? Yeah, so so the air budget wouldn't be uh, so much on the on on the specific customer. So 
So those are, we, we use those in two different, it's like two distinct things. On, on the one hand, we have the availability of a CUJ. So um, in the case of Citrix, a CUJ would be someone to log in and launch a new desktop. So we measure that independently of customers. So if, if that CUJ have a, has a really low SLI, that's going to trigger the error budget block and, and so on. Now on the other side, um, you know, on, on the customer specific side, we, we are going to be able to measure this SLI, so the login and launch a new desktop for, you know, the Linux Foundation as a customer or for, you know, the, the convention center Dublin. So we can see those individually, but the air budget is on a CUJ basis, is not on a customer basis. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. But you dodged the question about how do you set the size of your activity budget based on what your... So, the, so uh, uh, okay, so, so essentially the air budget is, is what's remaining from the SLO. So if the SLO says that you have to be uh, four nines available, so 99.9%, the air budget, I think, is somewhere around 25 minutes per month. So that's, that's kind of just, you know, part of how you set the SLO. Now, how you set the SLO has to do with a few different things. So, in a perfect world, it would have to do with you know us discussing and deciding what's the best we can do uh, based on historical data and those kind of things. In the real world, it, we also add some some sprinkles of uh, knowledge what the customers are able to tolerate and those kind of things. So, if if you know a customer can can tolerate you know three and a half nines, then and you know you, you're trying for four and a half nines, you're probably going to try and promise three and a half nines. And, and that's how the air budget then works. Did I not dodge it this time? Thank you. That was great. <laughs> Perfect. I'll take this off. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm in an SRE team, uh, and we have this. We have basically implemented most of the things in the. Yeah, that you talked about in the presentation, we basically have everything as code and stuff like that. We are facing this one challenge, though. We are basically providing services internally to our developers, logging, monitoring, and such, and we are providing them with uh, SLAs and SLOs, I guess, for us uh, uh, on how those are doing. But we, we are facing this challenge where uh, for some things, we want to actually guarantee something. Let's say a query to our logging system goes through in under 10 seconds. Mm -hmm some amount of times, let's say 99%. Uh, but then like some, in some certain scenarios, like in the evenings, we want to, let's say we want to alert on that all the time, but sometimes someone comes and actually wants to uh, go through only that one person go through a really like expensive query that will just take longer. Hmm. And in that time period, there's not enough queries to kind of cover that, so we get alerted because their budget kind of goes down mm -hmm. really fast. So I, I don't know if you have some solution to this. Uh, it's kind of a deep question, uh, or yeah. maybe not, I don't know. Well, I, I generally, the approach is to kind of think with the worst case scenario in mind. So, so this guy that comes in the evening and you know, kind of brings, breaks your alerting, that guy should be your baseline. Uh, you know, instead of what we usually do if if, if this one guy and everything, uh, everyone else is kind of normal, we kind of focus on the other people, but he's also a customer. So if, if you promise an internal SLA, you should kind of cover him as well. Um, now, other than that, I think, you know, it, it's more from what I'm, I'm trying to understand, it's more of a, a problem of right sizing, maybe auto scaling when you have these spikes rather than, than I think it's more of a, a problem of, of basically the, the p time period mm -hmm. of in which the, the queries get evaluated. Mm -hmm. so, so that one person who is trying this expensive query is the only person doing anything okay. at that point. So, right? And, and that will spike the error budget uh, burn down because um, there's nothing else to compare. If a lot of developers were kind of querying the service, it wouldn't be a problem because most of them would actually go through the through the SLO or mm -hmm. kind of under 10 seconds, let's say. But if he is the only one in that kind of time frame, then 
It so kind of goes wild. Just to understand, it's a latency-based SLI you give them based uh, on the query response time kind of thing? Yeah, basically we, we want them to be able to kind of query a logging system and get a response from that in under some seconds. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and it, it's kind of uh, like volume problem, I would say, mm -hmm. more than anything. Maybe we can talk later. It's Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Could we go back to your observability architecture slide? Yep. So how exactly are you using the open SLO spec here? So uh, uh, this is a bit better to show that. So, so essentially what's going to happen? Uh, OK, no, not, yeah, so this is the general pipeline on the observability as code, but what's going to happen in the open is a low spec is someone is going to be creating a file like this. Mm -hmm. And then this is going to go through the pipeline. And when it reaches deployment, it's going to go over in this green place. OK. It's going to go over in this green place, and, and that's where it's going to be deployed. And, and this service is going to start monitoring for this SLO. Oh, OK. Now I got it. So the observability API is, is a custom API that you are deploying mm -hmm. using yeah. the, that, uh, yeah, that this, pipeline. This, this is a Python server we've, we've, we've got. So it's not your application that you're deploying. You're no, no, deploying no, no, no. In the no, no. This is specifically service. for calculating uh, contextual SLIs and implementing and, and this is not based on sloth this is you have built home no no this is this is something different yeah so i use the sloth example because a sloth is something that's you know I, I think is if you're using kind of cloud native tools kubernetes with prometheus and even a distributed setup with thanos and grafana and those kind of things sloth is kind of the shortest path for you to implement uh, to implement slos got it and and once the uh, observability API is built with the open SLO spec, you don't have to go and, and uh, oh, the, the queries that you are using are, are in the observability API itself. It doesn't need to go change Splunk, Neuralink, or Elastic, or yep, anything exactly, of that sort. Yes. OK, got yes. it. Thank you. Hey, uh, first of all, thank you very much. That's a fascinating uh, uh, talk, and uh, I'm glad that I'll be able to ask you a million questions uh, <laughs> next month when uh, when you have the podcast, Open Observability Talks. Uh, but one question that uh, I think would be very re relevant to everyone, you talked about the CUJs, the customer user journeys, which is, I find the most challenging part because it's not technology. It's mm -hmm. about people and processes. And I'm actually curious, in, in an organization as big as, as yours, how you facilitated the discussion and brought on board all the stakeholders to come up with an effective way to define uh, the CUJs and also make the visibility to these uh, individuals in the organization? Yeah, so, so, um, so it, it, it all starts, you know, as you said, it's, it's, it's less of a technical discussion. It's more of a customer empathy discussion. So that's where you would normally have, and you know, that's, that's how it happens in, in most of our cases. Um, you would normally have PM with an architect talking about it and deciding. And essentially, what you, what you should have in mind when you implement it is, what's the path that, that a user is going gonna, is gonna to go down, which is going to affect revenue? You know, if, if you, you know, for us, for example, if you, if you don't have availability of launching new desktops, that's, that's kind of a big thing. That's what, what someone is paying for. So, you know, logging in and launching a new desktop is probably the number one. So what's, what's the, thec the second thing that's going to cost us money, that's going to cost us to lose customers? Those are kind of the questions that, that we, we, we go on to answer. And, you know, rightfully you mentioned that scale is, is something hard. You have to bring a lot of people on the table. But, um, you know, uh, giving, giving kind of the driver's seat to, to product management for this is what kind of solved the problem. Because as they prioritize the backlog, they, they have the empathy for, the, for, the, for our customers. They, they know exactly what the needs are. So, so it's easier for them to define what their customers are doing, what they need, what they want, those kind of things. So they aggregate. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
Okay, I think we are out of time. Dotans was the last question. You can hear us next month. We are going to be together in the Open Observability Talks. We're going to be talking more about those and customer experience and SLOs and how those relate. Um, thanks, thanks a lot for, for joining me today.